Jonah 4. We're nearing the end of our Jonah series. We have uh, this week and, of course, next week to finish out our Jonah series. We've been looking at Jonah, and we've been talking about the gracious and compassionate God that we see in Jonah's life and how God has been made very real to Jonah. And through this, we've been noticing that Jonah was spiritually immature, but God was working in this prophet who is supposed to be spiritually mature. God is working in him to make him spiritually mature. And we're going to look at that um, even today. Jonah chapter 4, we're going to read the entire chapter. Hear now the word of the Lord. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he, till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle. Well, all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord shall endure forever. And this is the word that will be taught unto you. Amen. And amen. Well, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father, indeed, this is your word. And these are your people. So now I pray that you might cement this word to their heart. May they be changed and transformed as a result of it. May you speak to them clearly and profoundly. And may they turn to you in full faith and obedience because of the power of your grace. In Jesus' precious holy name, amen and amen. Well, last week we studied um, chapter 3 of Jonah. And what we saw in chapter 3 in Jonah is the power of God demonstrated in the gospel and through the gospel. We saw it clearly, the power of God in the gospel given to Jonah. Now, what is the gospel, right? That's important. If we're going to understand the power of the gospel, we need to understand what the gospel is. The gospel at its core is good news. In fact, the Greek word for the gospel is euangelion, meaning good news. You, good, angelion, news or word. The gospel is the good news. The good news about what? The good news 
that the creator of the universe loves you. The good news that is that the creator of the earth loves you even though you are a sinner and even though you are stiff-necked, he loves you. And he loves you so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to come and die on your behalf to save you from death and hell. He took upon himself your sin that was imputed to him and he gave you his righteousness. And not only that, not only did he forgive you based on that reality, but the word of God then says that because of the gospel, this God, this creator God, made you sons and daughters. And now you and I can be in relationship with him. That's good news. That's amazing news. But within the good news of the gospel, we see the power of the gospel. And the power of the gospel is this, that he is able to transform your will. You know what the Bible tells us? The Bible tells us that everyone in this room is stiff-necked. Did you know that about yourself? It's not that you have a crank in your neck. That's not what it means. To be stiff-necked is an agricultural term, and it was used of oxen as you were Plowing with your oxen, you would try to move the oxen one way or another, but the oxen would not move. Its neck was stiff, and that was a sign that the oxen was obstinate. It did not want to go where it needed to go. And so it took power, it took strength to pull the oxen's neck or, or head in one way so that it will go the way that you want it to, so it could be fruitful and productive. What is it that can change our wills? What is it that could prevent you from being stiff-necked? It is only the power of the gospel. And that's what we saw last week in Jonah. Jonah chapter 3. We saw Jonah being stiff-necked, did not want to do the word of the Lord, did not want to accomplish the word of the Lord. And what did God have to do? God had to send a big storm and a big fish and give him his word again so that he might turn and follow him. Not only that, we saw the power of God in the life of a group of people who were stiff-necked. They were sinners. I promise you, the people of Nineveh were not choir boys and choir girls. They were vicious savages. What can change their heart to where all of them repenting, to where they're putting on clothes on their animals and throwing ashes and sackcloth over their animals? What can do all of that? Nothing but the power of God, nothing but the power of the Holy Spirit operational in their lives. Beloved, what is the only thing that can change your life? The power of the gospel. To change your obstinate, stiff-necked will away from yourself, away from your pleasures, away from your desires and what you want done with your life and turn it to where you are more concerned about what God wants for your life. That's the only thing that can do it. And now today we move and we see how Jonah responds to the power of God in chapter 4. And how does Jonah respond to the power of God? In the most unique, surprising way and shocking way possible. Jonah gets angry. And you're like, what? That's completely unexpected. It reminded me of a video that went viral several years ago, and there's been such more videos similar to this. It was a guy, he was, at a, he was at a game, and he was with his girlfriend, and all the cameras pointed to them, and it was so sweet. He got down on one knee, and you could hear him mouthing, I love you, I want to spend the rest of my life with you, will you marry me? And all of a sudden, the young lady starts crying, and you're like, oh, isn't that sweet? And then she looks at him and says, I don't want to marry you. What are you doing? And she pops up and runs away. And you're like, what? What just happened? Here's this guy pledging his undying love for you, and you run away? That's shocking. By the way, pro tip all the men in the room. Do not ask a young lady to marry you if you're not more than 100% sure, she'll say yes. I mean, like, like, that should just be common sense. 
doubt? Like, I'm not asking a woman to marry me if it's in doubt. Now, obviously, it was in doubt because she ran off, but it was just so shocking because no one expected that. No one expected her to run away. In the same way, no one's expecting Jonah to act this way. You know, Jesus said to the Pharisees, there's more joy in heaven over one sinner that repents than 99 who needs no repentance. Jonah shouldn't be angry. He should be dancing on a rooftop. He should be excited. He should be jumping up and down and joyous because God didn't just use him to save one. He saved an entire city filled with 120,000 plus people. And yet, what do we see? What do we see? We see Jonah angry. And, and, the, and look, at the beginning of chapter 4 and verse 1, it says it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was angry. It's not just that Jonah was angry. That's not what the Hebrew text is saying. And I wish you could see this for yourself. That's why we should probably teach Hebrew in like a Sunday school class or something. Wouldn't that be great? Everybody shake their heads like, yes, that would be good. That would be good. Because in the Hebrew text, it actually says that Jonah was hot mad. Jonah lost it. He got up. He was angry. He, he started spitting around. I don't know what the cuss words are in Hebrew, but he was using them. He was so angry at Yahweh. Yahweh, what are you doing? What are you doing? Now, hear me today. Jonah's anger, Jonah's anger is actually a sign of a deeper issue. Much in the same way, when my children have a fever, I know that that's a sign of pathology. That there's something wrong. They, they have some virus, some bacteria, whatever, right? They have something going on deep in them that this fever is a manifestation of. In the same way, when we see Jonah's anger, not just regular anger, but he is furious, we can see that there's something deeper going on inside of Jonah's heart. And whatever that something is, is what Yahweh wanted to get at. That's what Yahweh wanted to address. And make no mistake, chapter 4 in Jonah is an object lesson to each and every person inside here today. That what you get angry over, what you set your affections on, is an indicator of what's deep down in your heart. And that's what Yahweh wanted to address. That's what he wanted to deal with. And here's why that's important. We're going to look at what's deep down in Jonah's heart. Because there's two things happening here. God wants to reveal to Jonah what's deep down in his heart so he could fix it. But he also wants to show Jonah what's deep down in his heart so he can worship it and love it. And hear me today. When you know what's deep down in your heart, if you, when you know the sin that's deep down in your heart, when you know the weakness in your own heart and you begin to understand the glory that's in God's heart, that's the only way that you can truly worship the Lord your God as a Christian. No other way. If you are still holding on to sin, if there are aspects of your heart that you've walled off from the Lord, he wants that wide open and he wants full reign. And that's what he's doing to Jonah now, right? So I want, you to sh I want to sh show you two things in Jonah's heart that's going on deep in Jonah's heart right now. And the two things are this. First of all, God is trying to reveal Jonah's idol. And secondly, jo God is trying to show Jonah his profound self-righteousness. His profound self-righteousness. His idol and his profound self-righteousness. First of all, his idol. What's Jonah, Jonah's idol? Jonah's idol is plain and simple. His idol is that he's a Hebrew. He's a part of the people of God. And, and that idol that Jonah has causes him to be a racist, causes him to be a nationalist, causes him to hate others simply because he is on team Hebrew and nothing else. That's it. And you might say, well, Pastor Dennis, you're kind of pulling that out of thin air. No, 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 actually, that's in Scripture. First of all, notice with me Jonah chapter 1 and verse 9. It's clear all throughout the book. 
But I'm going to give you two examples. And by the way, if you're looking for a Bible study, right, you could always go through the book of Jonah and you could see this constantly, that his idols are everywhere. His self-righteousness is everywhere. I'm just going to give you a few examples. Here's example number one. Look at verse number nine. They asked Jonah, Jonah, who are you? How does Jonah respond? He says, um, he says to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and a dry land. Jonah could have started that sentence in all manner of ways. He could have started that sentence by saying, I'm a Jew. Or he could have started that sentence by saying, I worship Yahweh. But he, on purpose, began that sentence by saying, I am a Hebrew. Do you want to know why? Of course you do. That's why you're here. Here's why Jonah started off by saying, I am a Hebrew. The word Hebrew, the root word of the word Hebrew is the word Ivri. It means the ones who crossed over. And they only use, every Jew would use that term, the Ivri, to all other people who were not Jews. In other words, anytime they met a Gentile, they would describe themselves as an Ivri. Why? Because each and every person knew, in that area, knew what God did for the people of Israel. They knew that God uh, completely destroyed Egypt, the most powerful army in the known world, that God completely destroyed them, that Israel's God loved them, would protect them, and fight for them. He, everyone knew that. That's why he told these pagans, I am an he I'm a Hebrew. Why? Because that's his core identity. That's who he identifies with. That's what he believes. That's his idol. His idol is that he is a Hebrew. And so now you begin to understand when you go to chapter 4, why he responds to Yahweh in the way he does. Notice with me again in verse number 2 of chapter 4. He has pride that he's an Ivory, those that have crossed over, those that have God as their God. And now notice what he says. He prays to God. And by the way, this is an angry prayer, right? He's angry praying to God. And he says, oh, Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee from Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. What he just said with, to Yahweh was he was quoting back to Yahweh. He was quoting back to Yahweh. Nothing more than the Hebrews, uh, what you would call it. He is quoting back to Yahweh the Hebrews version of our creed. That's what he's doing. This is taken from Exodus chapter 33 through 34. You can read the story there. He's quoting back a creed to Yahweh. He says, Yahweh, this is our creed. We are your people. You're not supposed to show loving kindness to these heathens. You're not supposed to show your love to these heathens. You're not supposed to rescue these heathens. You're not supposed to uh, fight for these heathens. What are you doing? We are the Ivory. They are not. And Jonah is angry. Why? Because he has an idol, and that idol is that he's a Hebrew. Nobody else outside of the Jewish nation is a Hebrew. And when he sees God giving his steadfast love, his forgiveness, his patience, his kindness to another person, to another group of people, he's angry. And hear me today, now we're getting, now we're getting an opportunity to see what's at the core of Jonah's um, idolatry. Here it is. Jonah wants to use Yahweh to destroy the Ninevites because he wants to use Yahweh to protect his idol. If I could say it in a different way, Jonah needs Yahweh to destroy the Ninevites because his idol cannot. There's a Hebrew, uh, there's a Jewish rabbi. He gives the best definition of an idol that I've ever read or heard, and here it is. He says, an idol is something you give power to, but doesn't give you any power. I'll say that one more time because I don't want you to miss this because this is at the core of idolatry in all of our life. An idol is something that you personally give power to 
but cannot and does not give you any power. Notice, Jonah is given the fact that he's a Hebrew power. That's what he's living his life in accord with. That's what he's living his life uh, thinking. But the fact that he's a Hebrew cannot get him to destroy the Ninevites because that's powerless ultimately. So what does he need to do? He needs to depend on Yahweh to destroy that idol for himself. And when Yahweh doesn't do it, what does he do? He gets angry. And worse, he tells Yahweh, now that Yahweh isn't doing what he wants him to do, he says, I want to die. Why does he want to die? Because Yahweh wouldn't destroy the people who is destroy. Yahweh wouldn't destroy the people who is threatening his idol. And so he gets angry at Yahweh. And by the way, this is true whether you are a believer or a non-believer. A non-believer has idols. It could be money. It could be relationship. It could be their job. It could be their education. They have idols. And you notice the one thing they realize after they get the money, the education, the status, you know what they realize? That none of those things give them power. Now they give those things power. That's why uh, education and money and looks and all of these things, we give them power. That's why we pursue them. That's why we spend so much time going after them. We give those things power. But when you get those things, when you have money, and when you have a house, and when you have a relationship, when you have all of these things, you realize that you are just as powerless as you have ever been in your entire life. You know what's interesting? I remember when I was younger. When I was younger and I lived in my mother's home, I always said to myself, man, I can't wait to get out of this house. I'm tired of people telling me what to do, where to go. I'm tired of having to listen to these rules. I'm tired of having to obey uh, what, what my mother has to say. I can't wait until I go out and I get all this freedom. And just the other day, I looked at my calendar. And I said, what freedom? <laughs> what freedom? I looked at my bank account, what money? Right? See, that's, that's the folly of idols. We, we give them power. How do we give them power? Because we pursue after them. We long for them. We desire them. And then when we get them, what do we realize? We're just as powerful as when they started. And so what do we do? If you're a Christian, what do you do? You try to get God. You try to marshal God to prop up your idol. You know, James actually says this in a roundabout kind of way. James says this. He says, look, you ask not because you have not. And even when you ask, you ask amiss. Why? So you could consume it on your own lust. That's idolatry. If you're a Christian, right, the temptation is to turn something into an idol and then ask God to bless it. Why? Because your idol can't give you power. You know who has the power. Yahweh does. God does. And so you pray and you say, Lord, you know I want to do this for you. So why don't you bless it? And God doesn't give it to you. Why? Because you wanted to consume it on your own lust. And God isn't in the habit of blessing you so you can prop up your own idol. That's not what he does. He's not doing it to Jonah here, and he won't do it to us. And by the way, Christian, be careful how you talk about God. You know, whenever we say things like, I don't think God would want us to do this. Oh, really? How do you know? Is there a chapter and a verse that says that? Or you hear people say this all the time. A loving God wouldn't do this. Really? Do you have a chapter and verse that says that? Or oftentimes there's all this talk about God told me to do this or God is leading me to do this. How do you know God is leading you to do that? Do you see it in his word? Is it made plain to you? Is it confirmed by the scriptures and other godly people in your life? We need to be careful that we're not asking God to prop up our idols because we have them. And just like Jonah, we're savvy enough to expect that God is the one that's going to prop up that idol because we know that that idol has no power. All the power belongs to Yahweh. And that's why when he takes it away, 
When he takes away your idol, what do you do? You get angry, you get frustrated, you get depressed, and then you say to yourself, man, I, have, I don't want to live anymore. I don't want to be in a world where I can't have my idol and God too. Here's a simple idol test. You ready? Simple idol test. Two questions to ask yourself. What are you loving that you are supposed to hate? And what are you hating that you're supposed to love? It's a simple idol test, right? What are you loving that you are supposed to hate? And what are you hating that you're supposed to love? Real quick, that would reveal your idol. And what do you do when you find out what your idol is? Take it to God and ask him to smash it very quickly. Very quickly. Because God will have two ri- no rivals, right? And by the way, the Bible says no man can serve two masters. I remember one day walking into my wife with my wife when my uh, two daughters were really young, and she had both of them in her hands, and both of them were crying, right? Want attention. And I looked at her, I was like, man, I need to go back to the store, you know? <laughs> but what was happening in that moment? She was trying to serve two masters. Both of them were crying. Both of them wanted something from her. But she couldn't serve both of them. In the same way, hear me, you cannot serve two masters. You can either serve God or you can serve something else. But you can't have two. And that's why God works to smash all idols in your life because he loves you too much to allow you to have something that's powerless and meaningless in your life. And for you to be trusting in that. Real quickly, let's see Jonah's profound self-righteousness. And again, Jonah's self-righteousness is all over this book. But I want to limit his self-righteousness to chapter 4 because it's everywhere. And by the way, just as a reminder, what is self-righteousness? Self-righteousness or self-righteousness is a person, in someone I mean, who establishes their own righteousness and then judges everyone by their standards. That's someone who's self-righteous. When you establish your own laws, your own rules, and your own mind, completely divorced from God's word, or it might be predicated on God's word, but it's not true to God's word, you establish all sorts of laws and expectations and desires in your own mind, and then you impute that to someone else. And guess what? No one can ever match up to your standards. That's self-righteousness. And all of us have a tinge of it. Now, how do we see Jonah's self-righteousness in chapter 4? First of all, he stands in judgment of God. You know, one of the things about self-righteous people is they're so judgmental, and now Jonah's taking it too far. He's actually accusing God of antinomianism. What is antinomianism? Someone who's against the law, who doesn't keep the law, who doesn't obey the law, who doesn't follow the law, that believes that all there is is grace and forgiveness, But you don't need to obey the law. Notice how he does that in this verse. He says, God, I know you. I know you are God, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. All of those attributes are attributes unique to God. You will not find them attached to anybody else in Scripture. And what is he doing? He's accusing God of being too gracious. He says, God, this is the problem. You're too gracious. You're supposed to smoke these individuals, and here you are protecting them and providing salvation for them. That's it. Self-righteous people, they always stand in judgment of others, and you can never, ever measure up to them, and that's what Jonah is doing here. Jeremiah in in chapter 2, verse 5, asks the simple question of the people of Israel. What has Yahweh done? that you should turn and follow other gods. And we ask that question of Jonah, what exactly has Yahweh done that would make you stand in judgment of your God? The answer to that question is nothing. He's been eminently consistent. That's his character, and Jonah knows that. What else do we see self-righteous people do? Self-righteous people are the most double-minded people you can meet. They are right? They're always of two minds. They're always swaying between opinions. Uh, Prayer. Prayer is prominent in the book of Jonah. Again, you could go through and study that. But notice Jonah's prayer in chapter 2. 
Jonah's prayer in chapter 2 is one of submission and love, and he's thanking God for his salvation. He's praising the Lord for, for God being merciful to him and gracious to him. We see this all through chapter 2. And then by the time you get to chapter 4, what do you see? You see an angry Jonah. He's angry. Why is he so angry? Because he's double-minded. He's double-minded. He doesn't know right from wrong and wrong from right. And so whatever he feels in the moment is the most just thing to do. I feel like praising God right now, so I'll do it. But now I'm angry at God, and so I'm going to say it. He's worse than a two-year-old because he's completely double-minded. Notice the third thing. Self-righteous people always neglect the weightier matters of the law. Always. In other words, their moral compass is always off. A self-righteous person, their moral compass is always skewed. And we're going to see this next week, but in a different way. But I just want to show you here. In this passage, in chapter 4, we read this. Jonah has more uh, love, more appreciation for a plant than he does human beings. His moral compass is completely off. He's angry because God uh, killed a plant, but he's not happy that God saved all these people alive. Beloved, is your moral compass off? Do you spend your time getting angry and frustrated over things that you're supposed to be rejoicing over? Do you sit in, in judgment of people constantly instead of thanking God for where you are in your life? His moral compass is completely off, and therefore, God, like, we just look at him and say, what are you doing, Jonah? What are you doing? You're supposed to be rejoicing, but you're angry, and you're frustrated on top of that. You're worried about a plant? He's worried about a plant. Why? Because his moral compass is completely off. Instead of loving his neighbor, Jonah wants the judgment of his neighbor. Why? Moral compass is completely off. Now, what is the big takeaway? The big takeaway is simply this. Set your affection on things above and not on the things of this world. Jonah's idolatry, Jonah's self-righteousness are all because he's forgotten who Yahweh is. He's not setting his affections and his mind on things above. He is more concerned about what's happening in this world. He forgot that Yahweh delights in taking dead things and bringing them to life. He forgot the fact that Yahweh has the power to bring light out of profound darkness. He forgot the fact that Yahweh could take those who were strangers and aliens and make them sons and daughters of the king. That's Yahweh. That's God. That's the God who we serve. But Jonah forgot that. And because he forgot that, he ended up becoming angry and frustrated and separated from this God. We'll look at this next week, but notice the cliffhanger at the end of chapter 4. What's Jonah going to do? More to the point, what are you going to do? Are you going to submit to the Lord and set your affections on him? Or are you going to continue coddling your idols and sitting there and being self-righteous? Well, you know what God wants you to do. Stop being stiff-necked. Turn to him. Allow him to transform you. Allow him to shape you in the image of his son and not allow you to be shaped by your own image of who you are. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father, we certainly thank you and praise you that the message of Jonah is so powerful that we get to see the contours of our own hearts. That we coddle idols that we live in self-righteousness and that we as your people give power to things that cannot give us any power. So what do we do, Lord? Help us to come to you, smash our idols. Help us to turn when we are asked to turn. Help us to humble ourselves under your mighty hand and submit to your will and your way. 
And we ask this in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen. Amen.